Welcome to the Adam Does Movies Podcast, Episode 5, tentatively titled, My Love-Hate Relationship with Disney. That might be the, the title I go with, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how I feel the day I post this. Monday at 8 a.m. on all Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever streaming service you use. And then, 8 p.m. at night on YouTube at Adam Does Movies, where I do a live watch-along and chat in the comments with people. The conversation this week is around Disney, the animated space specifically. We're not going to be talking about, uh, you know, White Fang or uh, all the, you know, Flubber, all the live action stuff they've done. Uh, I mean, to a degree, we will eventually get to the New Age live action, which is really just CG versions of their classics. But to start with, we're going to go over the history how it affected me growing up, how much I really loved animation and the studio as a whole, and how now as an adult, I've become jaded, bitter, and cynical about everything they put out, and it sucks. I don't want to be there. I really don't. Uh, I'm then going to end with some viewer questions. I polled on YouTube. I asked people, I mean, it's not a poll. I just asked people, hey, give me a question about Disney. Anything, anything at all, I'll answer it within reason. Two to three questions I'll do, and then we'll just, uh, you know, we'll wrap up, we'll go on with our lives as we always do. (music) Ladies and gentlemen, in front of me right now I have a list of movies. All the Disney animated films they have distributed, most of the time they've had a hand in making. It's their studio after all. It's, um, it's impressive. And it goes back a lot further than I thought. Which makes me feel so much older than I did before I started this episode. All the way back in December of 1937, I looked at three different lists, by the way, that ordered all the Disney animated uh, releases by date. I looked at three different ones because I didn't believe the first two where I saw the date next to them. I cannot believe that Snow White and the Seven Dwarves came out in 1937. Are you out of your mind? The movie looks good. The animation is obviously dated as all hell, but 1937? Are you, that's insane. That is absolutely insane. I don't care much for Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, but when I was, you know, five or six, I imagined I watched it a lot and probably ate it up. The same can be said for Pinocchio. Pinocchio came out in 1940. There have been several iterations on the character. One of them just came out this year, directed by Robert Zemeckis. I don't know what Robert Zemeckis was smoking when he made that movie. It's absolute trash. The original animated iteration, easily my favorite. Most of these, I think most people know, are based on books, short stories. uh, And then Disney puts their spin on it, usually... They take a far less dark approach when it comes to these. (laughs) Then there's Fantasia, also 1940. I don't care for the Fantasia movies. They never did it for me. It's the celebration of music and animation, you know, hand in hand. The whole thing is a musical. No thanks. I'm not big on musicals, though. We then jump for, I didn't see the Reluctant Dragon. Again, I'm going to skip over some of these. I'm just going to kind of go to the meat, the ones that most people remember. Dumbo was 1941 and Bambi was 1942. As I go down this list, it's going to hit you that Disney has remade almost all of these, at least all the major ones. Dumbo had a remake a year or two back. I don't know anyone who saw it. I didn't even see it because I didn't care at all. Bambi surprisingly hasn't had one yet, although there is a Dwayne Johnson uh, Saturday Night Live (laughs) skit that's freaking hilarious where The Rock plays Bambi. If you haven't seen that, do yourself a favor and watch the four minute spoof video. It's so funny. It's kind of set like Fast and the Furious meets Bambi. Gritty live action, of course, making fun of all the live action stuff. A a few things I have not seen are kind of tossed in the middle here. And then we get up to Cinderella in 1950. Cinderella is solid. That's a great movie still to date. I like the end where she, you know, they're trying to find out whose slipper it is. 
I guess that's a shoe. Do they call it a slipper? Yeah, a glass slipper. Whenever I th think slipper, I think what you wear to bed. Or some people, I don't. Those things are bacteria traps. But the guy goes to the house and he's he drops the shoe because the evil stepmother... The, the stepmothers are always bitches in these movies, by the way. Drops it, shatters on the ground, and Cinderella's like, Well, I got the other one right here. Busts it out. And the look of pure terror on the stepmother and sister's faces is perfect priceless love it cinderella has been remade as well some people really like the live action remake i thought it was super boring and didn't care at all but that's regarded as one of the better ones alice in wonderland 1951 keep in mind i'm not born for any of these films these predate me by quite a bit and i've seen them all i saw them all as a kid much like my kids have seen a lot of these movies too Man, they made good movies back then. Sure, there was some racism thrown in. There was some, uh, you know, maybe some social commentary that's not quite up to the standards today. But people grow, people evolve, we change, we, we better ourselves. And sometimes what was funny then isn't funny now. Or doesn't really strike a good chord with a lot of individuals. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Alice in Wonderland, I always kind of like the idea behind it. The, the trippy, psychedelic, fever dream Alice is going on. I don't remember ever really enjoying it that much, though. I just kind of thought it was cool. Not so much to watch, but just the concepts there. Peter Pan was two years later in 1953. I didn't care for Peter Pan. The only version I like of that one is Hook. Which, yeah, Disney is on this kind of tear in the last half a decade where they're just remaking all their classics in this newer ugly animated quality that's all cg they did this a few times they dabbled a few times in the past there was a 101 dalmatians and a sequel 102 dalmatians naturally with glenn close and then they had hook with robin williams that was a great movie and what i liked about it was it was a different story i mean same story kind of but told in a different way you know, Peter Pan's grown up. He's an adult now. He's got to find Neverland again. Relive, bring back the magic for his son. Very well done. I don't know if it holds up anymore, but my memories are fond, and we'll leave it there. We'll leave it in the Disney vault. Leave it in the Adam vault. Lady and the Tramp. Uh, that was a fine little ditty. Came out in 1955. And then we have Sleeping Beauty, 1959. That's interesting to me because Sleeping Beauty feels a lot older than the, the movies I previously just listed off. I felt like Sleeping Beauty was way back by Snow White. But no, it, that's uh, 59. I guess maybe it's because they did a, a different art style for it. It definitely feels separated from the rest of the pack. And if I'm remembering correctly, Sleeping Beauty is the one with Maleficent. And they made those two great Maleficent movies. Well, I saw one of them. The first one was good. I don't know about the second. Uh, that's another great example of taking a well-known property and putting a twist on it, doing something new in that universe, which is what Disney should be doing now, but they're not. Uh, what do we got next here? 101 Dalmatians in 1961. Mm. I like 101 Dalmatians. I don't love it. This is another prime example of them taking the villain, giving her her own story. I didn't care for Cruella. It wasn't terrible. I've seen worse. But it was very much like a Disney version of The Devil Wears Prada, which is a fantastic movie that I've seen several times. Glenn Close. Come on. Oh, wait. No, not I'm sorry. I apologize. Meryl Streep. Amazing performance by Meryl Streep. Glenn Close, Meryl Streep. They're both great actresses. It's a fair thing to get wrong, I think. The Sword in the Stone. This is an underrated gem. Kind of overlooked, I think, over the years. 1963, Sword in the Stone. I, I, I enjoyed that one with Merlin. And you, you got the apprentice who pulls the sword out, having to become... I think it's King Arthur, if I, if I am remembering properly. Interesting. They put Mary Poppins on here as animated. I guess it's quasi animated we're gonna move past it we're not talking about that crap the jungle book i didn't care for this is really where the new trend of the live action movies started i know some people really love 
the Jungle Book, the the classic cartoon. That's fair. That's fine. It's it's fun and whimsical. It's colorful. The new version of the Jungle Book is the opposite. It's very dark. It's it's got some scary aspects. It has elements of the Lion King more than the Jungle Book. Baloo the Bear is there, but there's no musical numbers really. It's it's its own thing, and I really dug that movie when I saw it one time and never thought to watch it again because once again, I only needed to see that once. Had some fun, get in, get out. And I like that it went a different route with things. That's how these should be done. Then there's the Aristocats. Don't care. Uh, oh, they're interesting. They're putting bed knobs and broomsticks. So any little bit of animation is on this list. Bed knobs and broomsticks. <laughs> Freaking 1971. Still not born yet. Seen all of these movies. Robin Hood is great. That came out in 1973. Animal Robin Hood is solid. You have that catchy ass song. Okay, I'm done. Sorry. Went a little too long with that. It's a great film. Very fun. You have the snake. You have freaking dumbass king. I forgot the names of some of these characters. It's been a long time. I just remember it, it coming back to me. He's got the bird beak fake mask on. And then he puts the arrow through the other arrow. Classic Robin Hood. They'll probably do a remake of it at some point. And it'll be frightening because they'll have the 99% two life looking animals that are still CG rendered with no expressions on their face. Ugh. Can't imagine what that would be like. 1977 introduces the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Okay, this is interesting. This is the longest gap in time between movies. So 73 was Robin Hood. We have a four-year gap between that and Winnie the Pooh. Rescuers and Pete's Dragon all drop in 1977. Three movies in one year. And I can't say much about any of them. Except for The Rescuers was was a charming, quaint little flick. I like Rescuers Down Under better, personally. The Fox and the Hound in 1981, there might not be a more depressing film than that. When those two part ways at the end, when those two little buddies scamper away, oof. That's heartbreaking stuff. It's powerful. Please don't live action that ever. 1985 gave us The Black Cauldron. I recall reading several times that this movie bombed at the box office. I never saw it. Heard it was good. Never never bothered to see it. Nor did I see The Great Mouse Detective in 1986. Also fascinating, I'm now born. I was born in 1982. I would have been three when Cauldron came out. I would have been four when The Great Mouse Detective came out. My parents didn't show me either of them. We didn't see them ever. I would assume that this was a dark period in their life because they, you know, they had me. They're just trying to get through the day. Movies were out of the question at this point. Brave Little Toaster. I didn't even realize that was a Disney. 1987. I didn't realize that was a Disney. I'm I'm hitting puberty at 40. I I thought that was fine. I think I remember the Brave Little Toaster being an alright little yarn. And then we really take things up a notch with Who Framed Roger Rabbit in 1988. This is a bold movie. This thing was ballsy. Not only do you have Disney characters in this, you have Warner Brothers. You got Mickey and Donald and Daffy and freaking Bugs Bunny all in the mix here. Their screen time is limited, but when it's there, it is precious. Of course, you have Jessica Rabbit too, which uh, kind of ruined all men for many years to come on what a perfect woman would look like in a cartoon. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's asinine. And I love every minute of it. Also not technically a fully animated film. It's the quasi of live actors with, with cartoons, but it's so well done. I had to say something about, I also have a full review of who framed Roger Rabbit on the channel. Adam does movies. Oliver and Company never really did much for me. And then here's where we really get to the golden era. The golden age of Disney. I don't know. There's different eras. There's the Renaissance. There's the golden age. I'm not sure which is which. I might have just said it completely wrong. But we are in an age right now with the Little Mermaid. 1989. 
I remember liking this movie a lot as a kid just because of the undersea adventures, the colors, the music. All of it was great. The story's terrible. So Ariel is the lamest Disney princess by far. She has zero personality. She just kind of sings and looks cute. And that's about it. Her animal friends kind of carry it with Sebastian, Flounder, Scuttle, the, the whole nine yards. They're doing it all. And, and then Ursula as the villain is fantastic. And this whole thing is very ironic because the new live action Little Mermaid that's out right now is the complete opposite. Halle Bailey is really the only good thing in this film. Ursula, Melissa McCarthy, she's phoning it in. She's doing a good cosplay of the original. Definitely not elevating the material. And the sea creatures are miserable. The lifelike, National Geographic-esque characters, just, just complete shit. They don't have expressions on their faces because they're trying to render them realistically and animals don't talk or move their eyebrows or do anything. Like, you can't relate to these things. They're not fun in the slightest. Which is one of the many problems I have with these newer interpretations. But we'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. What else do we got? Ooh, DuckTales the movie. Treasure of the Lost Lamp. I was a big DuckTales guy. I love the show. Love the whole... Disney lineup back in the Diz. You had Bonkers at one point. That was kind of when I checked out. Bonkers wasn't really my cup of tea. But there was Animaniacs. There was the Aladdin cartoon. I think Little Mermaid had a cartoon at one point as well. A lot of those bigger properties ended up getting spin-off TV shows. It was pretty solid. I was always confused why Genie was there and he wasn't in his human form. But we, we just ignored it. They probably explained it away in the first episode that I didn't see. Ooh, we're getting to my favorite. After the Rescuers Down Under comes out in 1990, we have my favorite Disney animated film with a princess. Di favorite Disney animated princess film. That is Beauty and the Beast. Tale as old as time. A ski dee 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 dee. A true as it can be. A -din 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 -din. I'm not going to keep going, but the music in that, flawless. Probably my favorite, well, it is my favorite, it's my favorite set of music in a Disney film. In a film full stop, I think. Just everything about it works. Belle's a great Disney princess. Strong female lead. Doesn't need no man. She needs a beast to ravage her. She's stuck in a book until she's forced to live in the real world. It's all, it's all very well done. Very well handled. I, I'm a big fan of this one. Not so much the live action again, which is too bad because... Emma Watson seemed like a shoe in for the role. Just, just such a natural beauty, such a natural talent. Can't really sing very well. The auto, the auto tune tried to carry her, but uh, yeah, no, no thanks. And then we have back to back, folks. We go from eighty ones beating the beast to dun 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 skit dun 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 dun. Aladdin. Aladdin is good. You got Robin Williams as the genie, who. I mean, we could go on a full tangent about Robin Williams and just the interesting person he was. But one of his big stipulations doing a Disney film was that he would not be used. His character would not be used for merch, for different things for people to buy and consume. He didn't want that. His art was the screen. His art was the theater. And he really wanted the genie to just be in the movie and not be plastered on posters and everything. And Disney absolutely did not keep their word. And it pissed Robin Williams off. And he would go on to not work for Disney for many, many years until all the upper management was cleaned out. New people came in and came back to Robin Williams and said, dude, come back to us now. Please come back to us. And he did. And he signed, I believe, two or three movies to do with them. All of them pretty awful. Flubber, Bicentennial Man, One More. I'm not sure. And this is also why he's not the voice of the genie in the second Aladdin movie, but I believe he's the genie again for the third one. Aladdin 2 and 3, of course, went straight to DVD, straight to VHS, probably back in those days. I don't know if DVD was around yet. Yeah. They're, they're not good movies. They're, they're passable, though. They're passable. The Nightmare Before Christmas, 1993. People love this film. I'm truly not a fan of it. I think I would be. Tim Burton's producing, I think. I believe it's the director of Coraline. A lot of people tribute Tim Burton to directing, but I don't believe he did. 
it's got the look I like, it's got some music, it's got some a dark atmosphere, a fun, creative spin on holidays. I just don't, it didn't jive with me. I, I don't really know why. Something about it was just off the entire way through, and people really like this movie. And then we have... Hey, uh, Lion King. 1994, baby. Now we're really getting into it. Now we're really where I like to live. I'm 12 years old at the time. I'm seeing this movie in theaters. This is one of the first movies I remember going to in theaters. Animated movies where I was just freaking just ensconced in everything on the big screen. Of course, it's not the first movie I've seen in theaters, but it's the first one I really remember going, holy crap, this is cinema, this is art. Th that opening number is so explosive. The colors, the, the atmosphere, the music, it's all perfect. And then they ruin it with that shitty new version that made 1.6 billion dollars it's one of the highest grossing movies that's so depressing and it's entirely based on nostalgia lion king man great film we're gonna jump forward there's the goofy movie came out pocahontas ah eh, whatever Toy Story, 1995. You got a friend in me. <laughs> you got a friend in me. No one's going to listen to this podcast next time if I keep singing. Toy Story was revolutionary. First 3D modeled animated film in theaters. You can find some fun facts on it. I unfortunately didn't get any, but I remember reading that it would take days to render single frames of animation for this thing. They had supercomputers running around the clock to render just small little segments of this film. Uh, I just, Pixar, pioneers in the industry now, really put it all out there, and they had something special. Another film I remember watching in theaters, I think my mom showed up late, me, my brother, and my dad went. This was, we had a really terrible movie theater in Monticello. There was no incline. I don't know who designed theaters originally, but they were madmen. They were insane to not put this thing on a slope. So all the chairs were same height. You're looking at the back of someone's head. This was a packed, sold-out show. I couldn't see shit. I'm watching this movie in between different crevasses, different... You know, trying to sit and position myself in a way that I can dodge a person's hat and another person's hair and another person's jacket just to make out Buzz and Woody on the big screen. My mom rolls in. She couldn't believe what was what was on the screen at the time. No one could. Absolutely. Earth-shattering shit with Toy Story. And now we got Toy Story 5 on the way. All these years later, still kicking. Well, of course. I mean... It, why wouldn't it? The, the movies are all pretty damn good. We're not done with the 2D, though. There is a fun James and the Giant Peach that came out in 1996. The I like this movie. I haven't watched it since probably 1996. I just... This was another one that was kind of that Tim Burton-esque stop motion, very dark style. It worked this time around. Just a very bizarre thing. I know this one wasn't by Disney. It was... Well, who's it say? Skellington Productions. Disney probably distributed it. They would go on to distribute a lot of movies that aren't actually theirs. Studio Ghibli or Studio Ghibli, however you pronounce that. Spirited Away, I know, is a Disney distributed film. Hunchback of Notre Dame or Dame, depending on how you want to say things. Not my favorite. I know some people really like this one from 1996. We are going to be getting to the tail end of 2D animation. It's going to be going out the door here very shortly. Hercules, it's a classic. 1997. I am absolutely sure they're going to live action this one at some point. Good luck. Mulan. I will say, let me back up. Hercules, out of all of these, does have potential to be very cool to see again on the big screen. I just hope they don't make it a musical, and I hope they do try to tell 
a different spin on the story instead of doing a shot for shot 99% remake. That's not interesting. Here we have our second Pixar movie with A Bug's Life. Then we have Doug's first movie, Tarzan. I'm not a huge fan of Tarzan either. You have like 55 songs by Phil Collins, who I do like a lot. I just don't, I don't want to spend time in the jungle with Tarzan. I'm sorry. Although Jane was hot. Jane was, Jane was good looking. Tarzan was hot. I mean, he's like Tony Hawk skateboarding on the vines, going around loops. Pretty, pretty clever what they did with him. Did I skip over Mulan? I think, yeah, Mulan's fine. There's a lot of fine-ish movies here. It feels like they're really on the the 3D train now because Toy Story 2 comes out in 1999 and then we have Fantasia 2000 in, you guessed it, 2000. I still don't care for Fantasia. I I respect it. I respect the game, but I don't want to take part in it. Toy Story 2, I think, is better than the first. Toy Story 2 is still my favorite of the... The forology, the quad, the quad, quadrigy, that's not a word. The Tigger movie, followed by Dinosaur. Dinosaur, not that bad. Not too bad. Not to be confused with the good dinosaur that sucks. Dinosaur is good, though. And then we have the final, well, one of the final. Wait, where's it at? Hang on. Hang on a second. Are they missing a movie off this list? Or am I just in the wrong order? Well, we're going to say this one first, and then I'll keep going and look for it. But I'm not seeing it here. We have The Emperor's New Groove. We are getting to the tail end of 2D. We are There's like two more after this, to my recollection. Emperor's New Groove is so freaking good. Probably my favorite Disney movie. It's so different from everything they do. It's basically Tommy Boy in a 2D animated style. You have David Spade, John Goodman, Kronk and Yzma as the villains are some of the best villains you'll ever find. The voice acting, the animation, it's all so damn funny. And it works so well. And I don't think the movie did very well. I think it it, it kind of bombed. Which solidified things to Disney in their mind. Like, okay, we're on the right track with this 3D stuff. People don't want 2D anymore. Bad marketing hurt that one. I guess there was Recess, then there was Atlantis. Atlantis was also kind of weak. It had such a cool idea. They just kind of fumbled it. It just didn't work. I don't really want to go down. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to save Pixar for another podcast because this could run for five hours if I talked about all the Pixar stuff too. We're keeping it to Disney. And I know Pixar and Disney are married. It's the same thing. But we're going to keep 3D animated movies for another pod. Maybe next week we do that. We'll see how I we'll see how I feel about it when we get closer to the end of this. But we're really sticking with the 2D stuff. And I think Brother Bear, which I still haven't seen. Home on the Range, which I unfortunately did see. The one with the three cows. One of them's Roseanne Barr, I think. Horrible film. And there should be one more. When did The Princess and the Frog come out? Why is that not on here? This this needs to be updated. Oh, there it is. 2009. For The Princess and the Frog. The last hurrah for 2D Disney animation on the big screen. It's been a long time. It's been a long day without you, my friend. We need to fictitiously pour one out for 2D Disney animation because it's all over. Which is so sad because there's new 2D animation coming out that looks stellar. We have the new Spider-Verse movie next week. Top of the line animation. We have a new Ninja Turtles movie done in kind of the same vein as Into the Spider-Verse, or as this one's known as Across the Spider-Verse Part 1. Really looking forward to both of those. I'm hoping Disney takes some inspiration, relaunches a studio that can make some beautiful stuff. Honestly, since they're redoing this live, they're doing the live action thing, I would have much preferred if they just updated their 2D animation of some of these classics. Like, uh, you know, would that have been hard to just redo The Little Mermaid again as an animated film, but with the modern tech? You keep the voices, you keep the spirit intact, you can still have those larger-than-life moments, and the characters can still be expressive. 
Which is, I guess, a good jumping off point to go to this second, shorter, rambling section of the podcast, which is, what in the hell is happening at Disney? I listed off so many wonderful films, so many creative movies that work for both kids and adults alike. It's a a broad spectrum. But in the last six or seven years, all we're getting now are soulless remakes. And they really are soulless remakes. (laughs) I'm looking at their list and Lion King, Aladdin, The Little Mermaid. These are all shot for shot. They make little tweaks here and there. But for the most part, you're sitting and watching a thing you've already seen before in 4K high def resolution, but without the charm intact. That doesn't work for me. And I know it doesn't work for a lot of people, yet these movies will continue to exist because they all make a ton of money. Aladdin, just shy of a billion. It might have made over a billion, actually. Beauty and the Beast did. The Lion King did. We'll see how The Little Mermaid tracking, but I'm guessing it's going to get up there, too. People like nostalgia. That's why we still have sequels to Fast and the Furious. There's ten of them now. That's why there's a new Indiana Jones movie coming out. That's why Star Wars will never die and they'll just keep going back to the Skywalker well instead of telling new stories. Because risk management is a big thing in Hollywood. And Disney knows this. They look at their old properties and how well they're loved. They look at their theme park and how they haven't changed anything in 50 years. You can still go on the Peter Pan ride, Little Mermaid ride, the magic carpet ride. These haven't been updated. It's insane. They need to be updated. They're so bad now. I went last year with my family and we just thought, who's this park for? Ages 5 to 8? Because that really seems like the only people that are going to get any thrills out of these anymore. The rides are old. They're wonky. They need to be dusted off and polished and anew. But there's one thing you won't find at any of the theme parks. And that's the modern character designs. You don't see updated rides with the live action versions of these characters because that's not the thing people like which makes me so puzzled as to why they keep doing it why keep coming out with these versions when you can make something new in the same universe they've done it they did it with cruella they did it with maleficent why not do it with the little mermaid you didn't have to make ariel again you could have had halle bailey play her sister uh, it doesn't matter with Jessica. Like, I don't give a shit what she's... Anastasia, call her something else. Have her go on a brand new Under the Sea adventure. You could even have a cameo from Ariel. Show the back of her red head and be like, oh, and then people will be like, wow, that's Ariel. Look, that's Ariel. And then we move on with the actual story, which is unique and different. There's so many tales to tell in all of these properties. The Lion King didn't need to be a retread. Aladdin didn't have to focus on Jasmine and Aladdin. Maybe it's the genie's backstory of how he got suckered into going into the lamp. Maybe it's just another story in Agrabah that doesn't have to do with any of these people. Jafar could still be the villain. We know he's been shady for many, many years. This isn't his first rodeo. We could have a young, sexy Jafar, maybe, (laughs) for the ladies. It's just so uninteresting. I saw The Little Mermaid and I sat there so just stock thinking, man, what a tedious film this is to get through. And why is it two hours long? Why does do all these live action movies look so muddy and dark and lack energy? Well, it's because of the art style. It's because of the decision to go for this quasi realistic look to the characters. The charm is sucked out of everything. But when we keep voting with our wallet and saying we like these movies, they're just going to keep doing the lazy ones. This lazy, half-ass effort. Why tell a new story when there's a perfectly good one? If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? That's that's the motto. And they are using that motto to a T. They did try recently, Disney Studios. Again, these are 3D, so I don't want to go into too much of them. But, uh, you know, Strange World came out came out left unceremoniously no one cared about it that was a disney studio film they also did recently 
Raya and the Last Dragon. I don't know how that... That kind of came out during COVID, though, so a lot of people saw that at home. I didn't care for Raya and the Last Dragon. I do like Frozen, and I do like Tangled. Those are good flicks. Wreck-It Ralph was a good flick. They have it in them to still tell these great stories. And again, we can go into those more when we when we focus more on the 3D animated ones. I guess this is just more of a, a call or complaint to Disney that, hey, listen, you, you brought animation to life on the big screen and then you abandoned it because you thought people were uninterested anymore. It's just not the case. You made a few missteps with some of the movies and the marketing that came out, but there is absolutely an audience for this type of stuff. Look how well Into the Spider-Verse did. And it's not alone. Other people are starting to take note and they're making movies in that same vein. Get back to it, Disney. Bring it back. I want more 2D animations. I want to fall in love with this studio again because it doesn't matter how old you are, believe it or not. I know the internet seems to think that middle-aged dudes can't have an opinion on a film. They're going to be um, disappointed to find out that Rotten Tomatoes is all certified critics that are like 40. Like myself, I am a certified critic. If you're going to use the target audience to review films, then the Little Mermaid reviews are all going to be done by seven-year-old girls. And that's just not really something that I need to hear from. They, they don't know how to type really yet. And that's a problem when you're going to try to come up with a, a cohesive, coherent review online. <laughs> So yeah, you kind of have to listen a little bit to the 40-year-old guy because he has experience in the movie industry. He's seen a lot of films, knows a lot. And same with the, you know, any any anybody. An 80-year-old lady is going to be a person I'll go to when I want to hear what she has to say about cinema. I would find it very fascinating because there's life experience there. And if you just want to hear what a little kid has to say about a movie that's definitely geared towards a kid, then you don't need critics and you're going to go see the movie regardless. And that's perfectly fine too. You don't need, you know, to listen to critics. You don't need to listen to any critics, food, movie, sports, or otherwise. You like what you like and that's enough. But some people out there genuinely don't want to waste their money or don't really know what to expect from a flick or don't have time to research it themselves. And that's where someone like me comes in and says, yep, it's another live action Disney movie just like the previous four or five. It has nothing really new to offer. They sprinkle in one or two new songs that aren't very good. They remove a song that you miss from the original. They gender swap or they race swap or they do something to get people talking or rile people up, stay in the news, and it's just so boring and paint by numbers, it's not even worth getting upset about anymore, because we have the originals, and honestly, they're better almost every single time anyways. The only bummer is, it's allocating resources, time, funds, and, rev and, and money away from other projects. There's people giving scripts to Disney and other studios every single day. There are great scripts. I guarantee you there are some of the most creative, amazing scripts out there that are just sitting and collecting dust because Disney and you know and other studios are looking at their old properties and saying, how can we get some more blood out of this stone? How can we take these people for what they're worth? Because nostalgia is selling right now, not that new screenplay over there. And that's what pisses me off. Okay, there was my rant, there was my spiel, and my walk down memory lane when it comes to the Disney animated films and my thoughts on these live action ones. They're insulting, they need to stop. Or they need to at least try a little bit and tell a new story in the same universe as before. That's fine. You want to bank off nostalgia, bank off of it, but do it with a little bit of respect, <laughs> you know? Try a little bit. J just lie to me if you have to. Right before recording this podcast, I asked my YouTube community if they had any questions pertaining to Disney animated films, and thankfully a couple stepped up right at the last minute. Here's a couple now. Mr. Mosby asks, have you seen any of the direct-to-video animated sequels to Disney Renaissance movies? If so, what are your thoughts? Okay, he says Renaissance, which makes me think that the... Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin fall under that, and not the golden era like I said before. I'm wrong a lot. That's okay. You just have to live with it. Yes, I have. I've seen the Aladdin sequels, which I think I mentioned before, and now I've forgotten the, the titles of them. <laughs> I don't think I saw the stupid Beauty and the Beast, Winter Wonderland, Christmas extravaganza. 
I did see the Little Mermaid sequels because my kids wanted to watch them. I don't mind any of them. Lion King, there was like Lion King one and a half or something. Simba's Pride, not really into any of them. The animation's always quite a bit worse. The voice acting's a big step down. It's a cosplay of the other versions, so they didn't work that well. I would say Aladdin's probably the better of the, the sequels that went direct to DVD. These types of movies that they did back in the 90s where they didn't go to theaters are the equivalent of basically everything that goes straight to Disney+. Plus. Pretty bad. Pretty half-assed attempts at sequels or full-on movies. Next question comes from Chapman Reviews. What are your thoughts on The Little Mermaid 2, Return to the Sea, and The Little Mermaid Ariel's Beginnings? Or beginning, I guess. Wow, I, I just mentioned those. And I don't really remember anything about them. I know that Ariel's mom is in one of them. And I think Ursula is in the sequel as a hot mermaid. I, I, I genuinely don't remember them. I think that they're watchable and probably nothing more. I can't pronounce this guy's name, but he says, Which animated Disney film should Zack Snyder remake as a live action? Nothing can't be an answer. <laughs> oh my god. You know what? I'm going to say The Black Cauldron because I haven't seen it and I know it bombed. So if any movie deserves to probably get a second chance at life, it's Black Cauldron and Zack Snyder's the guy for the job. Because it just sounds gritty, doesn't it? It sounds intense. And the man from 300, the man from Dawn of the Dead, the man from the DCEU back in the day, he's going to make it work. Digital Dosage asks... Overall, are you an ardent fan of Disney animation or just a casual viewer throughout the childhood? And of course, adulthood because you're a critic. Genuinely curious because I've just never been a big Disney animation fan, but don't dislike these films or anything. Okay. I am a big fan. I think I've established that throughout this podcast. I grew up on Disney. I actually wanted to be a Disney employee. I wanted to work for Disney as a freehand animator. What turned me off was actually going to Disney World the first time with my folks when I was, uh, I don't know, young teens. Actually, I think I was probably nine, eight or nine. And I saw how the animators do their process, an instant turnoff for me, how they have to do frame by frame, tracing over top layers, going back and forth constantly, flipping the sheet on top of the other one. I, I thought it was a nightmare. And the fact that they don't even do an entire scene by themselves There'll be several animators working on one frame. One guy's handling Beast, the other's handling Bell. Miserable. But much appreciation for what those guys do. A, a complete labor of love. Which is probably why once in a while they slipped in a, you know, slipped in a penis or a, the leaves making out the word sex. Because they were sitting there for hour upon hour a day just thinking, letting their mind wander. And yeah, guys, you know, we tend to... We tend to go to some of the more perverse things. <laughs> uh, last question I'm going to take is from Video Void TV. Have you seen Cinderella? It was one of the first. It was different and quite good, but didn't make as much money as the lifeless carbon copies that followed. If you haven't, I suggest a watch. You'll be surprised. Video Void, I assume, is talking about the live action Cinderella, which I did see and found kind of boring. To his credit and the film's credit, it is very much its own thing. For better and worse. I just found it a little lackluster all around. Now maybe it's because I did go in with the assumption that it was going to be closer to the animated classic. And I think that's probably what a lot of people were doing. Which is another reason why Disney shouldn't do this stuff. They should definitely make new things. Or take stuff from that universe but a twist. Cinderella was called Cinderella. It had the three stepsisters, it had the stepmother, and it had Cind herself. Cinder, whatever the hell she was called in that. It just was too close without being close at the same time. You have to do something different. You have to do a, Mal a Maleficent or a Cruella. Otherwise, you have to do this lifeless shot-for-shot -shot stuff that people seem to like and you make a lot of money. That's where Disney's coming from, and in that sense, they're right to do it. But they're also very wrong at the same time. Okay, well, there you go. Those are some of the viewer questions. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode. Next week, I'm guessing we're probably going to go down the Pixar memory list and some of the 3D animated stuff that Disney's putting out. 
I talked about Tangle. They talked about Frozen. They'll be in the conversation. We got Big Hero 6. Lots of stuff to cover. Luca turning red. I mean, they're just coming to me. They're just flying at me. Chicken Little, which I call Chicken Shit because it wasn't very good. Yeah, I'm excited. Let me know if you're on YouTube what your favorite 3D animated one is. And also, tell me what your favorite 2D animated film is from Disney. I would love to hear that. I appreciate it. Please follow, subscribe, tell your mom, tell your friend down the road about the podcast. Want to keep it growing, keep it thriving. Last thing I will humbly ask, if you really like the podcast, if you've been following me for a while on YouTube, Adam Does Movies, feel free to jump by Patreon at patreon.com slash Adam Does Movies. There's different tier levels there where you can support the show, support my channel. It's a one-man operation. It's a passion project. There's a $1 a month tier. It goes up to like a hundred bucks a month if you want to get really crazy with it. But any support is support. And I would really appreciate it. You get you get perks there as well. There's exclusive videos. There's uh, access to the private Discord server. Lots of good stuff for you just for becoming a member. And I would thank you very much. All right, that's the podcast. I'll see you next time.